Hello everyone and welcome to a special episode of Policy Verse. 73 years ago, on 26 January 1950, India enacted its constitution. Indian constitution is the longest written national constitution in the world. So to commemorate this special occasion, we at FDR thought it would be extremely fitting to have an in-depth conversation about our constitution, its role in an ever-changing Indian society, and how far we've come along as a constitutional democracy. To discuss this in detail, we have with us Dr. Jay Prakash Narayan, Founder and General Secretary of FDR. I'm Shweta, joined by my colleague Sumeda. Thank you, sir, and welcome. Thank so, you. So let us start with a very fundamental question, sir, that every citizen of every country would have. Uh, so what is the role of a constitution in today's society and why do we need a constitution? Sweta, as democracies emerged from initially monarchies and later uh, feudal oligarchies, you required certain rules of the game. Earlier, monarchy, divinity. The god anointed the monarch, monarch's son or daughter. Oftentimes the son became the next monarch. Monarch had absolute powers. Uh, and therefore, it was part of the human consciousness. Mm. If you are lucky to have a wise monarch like an Ashoka or an Akbar, mm. things were good. If you were unlucky to have a, a terrible tyrant, then mm. people paid the price. Mm. There was no rule of law because there was no law. Mm. Whatever the monarch said was law. Feudalism, different framework, but roughly the same approach. That. God anointed, there are certain things impenetrable, immutable, and you had to accept your position as a vassal or a servant or a feudal lord, and that's it. But once you have a democracy, everybody has the stake in the system. Everybody has a share in power. Therefore, you have to create an architecture. Day-to-day -day loss is one thing. Day-to-day -day loss is about society and the citizens. The interface between the citizen and the society so that my freedom is not at your cost has to be decided by some legal framework. That is law. But the constitution is not about those laws. It's about the architecture. Who will do what? And how will they become those who? When it's not by birth, when it's not by feudal privilege, then how do you choose the people who will make decisions for us? And what is the accountability framework? And what are the limits of their powers? And how do you protect the citizen from the state and the collective from the individual perfidy? Mm. Therefore, is there a right kind of balance? So the basic architecture, unless the constitution defines it, it may be written or unwritten. Britain, for instance, has no written constitution. But it would be wrong to say Britain has no constitution. Mm. Oftentimes, British courts and British public, they talk about British constitution. Because the practices perfected over a period of time and the traditions became the constitution in Britain. Therefore, the British Supreme Court mm -hmm. actually examines the constitutionality of several laws. Recently, if you remember, mm -hmm. about the immigrants to Britain, the government, conservative government came up with a policy that they would all be sent to Uganda or some other country. There are all kinds of opinions in the country. The matter was tested before British courts. Why? Because there is a constitution, even if it's unwritten. If there is no constitution, whatever is the law, the parliament is supreme. But when the parliament made a law, the Supreme Court sat in judgment because there is a constitution by practice and tradition in Britain. And once you codify, you know, the international law, European courts decisions and the collective consensus in the country at a point of time, that became the constitution. So a modern democracy, I dare say, cannot work without that kind of an operative framework. And that is the constitution. Sir, uh the enactment of the constitution was a momentous occasion for us. It marked the birth of a new nation uh, based on principles, democratic principles of liberty, equality and fraternity. But at the same time, our constitution makers had the unenviable task of making such a constitution for a very fractious society at that point of time. In that context and also in the context of how the constitution has uh, worked in the past seven decades and more, what do you think uh, are the things that our constitution got right? Sumetha, what our founding fathers did was, I'm using the word founding fathers not in a gender sense, but in a, in a generic sense, uh, it was remarkable. Oftentimes we take it for granted. It's the first time in human history 
that any nation, let alone a large, complex, diverse nation with a rich history of thousands of years, any nation ever dared to embrace universal franchise. In 1947 to 50, it is unthinkable that every human being, the Brahman and the Dalit, the rich and the poor, the urban and the rural, the educated and uneducated, English speaking and non Hindi speaking, that they would all get this equal right and all the right to vote, and each vote is equal in the eyes of law, or all have the same rights and they'll be enforced. It was an audacious thing. Today, by, by repeated um, uh, exercise of that and, and the day to day discussion on that, we take it for granted. But that was Amazing. And remember our society, a hierarchical society, by birth we always distinguished some people. Some people by birth were disadvantaged. It was natural. The men were always superior. The women were always inferior. Many of these things were taken for granted. They were embedded in our culture, in our tradition, in our religious discourse, in our Puranas, in our all kinds of things. And to come out of that and create a modern liberal democracy by constitutional means was an extraordinarily daring experiment. We should be immensely grateful to them. The second thing they have done is, apart from universal franchise, they understood what was happening in the rest of the world. Obviously, Britain, we were very familiar with that for 150 years, in some form or other, the British democratic practices came to India. Most of our leaders studied in Britain. Some of our leaders actually became representatives in Britain. Dada Bhai was a member of parliament in Britain. Uh, and therefore, they are very familiar with the system. They embraced many of the British concepts, including the Westminster model. But that apart, director principles are borrowed from Ireland. The doctrine of separation of powers clearly identified, along with written constitution, was borrowed from the United States. And many things they, they tried to see how they fitted into Indian conditions. Uh, and that required a detailed expertise, understanding, and insights. And you see the rich debates in the Constituent Assembly on many of these issues. The third is, they were also wise in making sure that it's not a complete rupture from the past. Many people may or may not be aware, our constitution making was part revolution and part continuity. And revolution was symbolized by nobody signing it, if you recognize, the members of the Constituent Assembly signed it. The head of the state at that time, the Viceroy, did not sign it because consciously our Elected members realized that we don't require his sanction. Though every law required his approval. Until we became republic, the viceroy or the governor general had to approve. But the governor general never signed it. The members of the assembly, we the people on our behalf, they signed it. So that's a symbol of a revolution. And yet there was continuity because they realized the basic organs of state, the structure of the state, the rupture is not a very wise thing. And that's why some people actually criticize, I believe unjustly, that much of the constitution is merely a replica of the 1935, Government of the Act of 1935. I would actually say it's a strength. Because 1935 Act itself was thought through very carefully. While there was no democracy, there was no universal franchise, it actually gave the framework for federalism which never was coming to, came into operation. Uh, federalism part came into operation, but the central uh, union legislature part at the time called central legislature, it did not come into operation. And uh, they brought in the element of a diarchy at the national level as of earlier at the state level there was diarchy. So there was a progression in our constitutional evolution since uh, let's say 1909. And our constitution makers understood, therefore the issues that are relevant, as long as they were rational and suitable to a democratic polity, they embraced. Some of them perhaps uh, can be questioned. Should there be nominated governors? Should the government defender have untrammeled powers to dismiss a government? Uh, but I think Ambedkar and his colleagues uh, felt we should leave it to the judgment and the wisdom of the functionaries at a point of time without constraining their hands too much. Uh, but these three factors, the audacity of universal franchise and fundamental rights, the embracing the vital principles of the constitution making from the rest of the world to the extent they are relevant to us. And the continuity, even as there is a rupture, I think they have served us very well. They have done a remarkable job. Whether it's the preamble, which gave us a broad sense of vision and direction, 
are the fundamental rights. And we did a particularly good job in our country, unlike uh, many other countries where fundamental rights are uh, codified, that the rights go with responsibilities. And your freedom, sir, begins where my nose begins. And therefore, reasonable restraints, the doctrine of reasonable restraints, it is embedded in the Constitution itself. Article 19 talks about eight provisions whereby your freedom of speech and other rights are uh, contained. So there's no absolute right. You see, United States, some other countries, and even in social media, a lot of debate about absolute freedom of uh, speech. Indian law and Indian society and our constitution never accepted absolute freedom. Mm -hmm. Just like there cannot be absolute uh, authoritarian uh, leadership, there cannot be absolute freedom either. There are restraints on the citizen, restraints on the ruler. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very wise thing. Some people may criticize because we embrace all too easily and all too readily American practice as something else. But I genuinely believe that these restraints are necessary. If my freedom of speech is at the cost of your reputation or your well-being or at the cost of creating animosity between communities, I don't think that freedom can be accepted. So in that sense, a lot of wisdom, even as they embraced some of the principles and some of the practices of other countries. So I think all in all, it's a wonderful document. No document is perfect. And again, constitution make us realize that and therefore, they provide a relatively easy mechanism. Article 368 tells you how to amend the constitution. Again, graded. Mm -hmm. The more important provisions, much bigger supermajority of parliament of the states. Other provisions, supermajority. Some even by a simple law. Mm -hmm. The legislative council in the states, the upper house in the states, you can actually amend the, uh, the composition by a simple law of parliament. So, it's a very well-designed, well-thought-out structure, giving space for flexibility and improvement over time. Sir, as you rightly said, the fundamental rights that are guaranteed in our constitution are not absolute and that is a good thing. Sir, but with respect to freedom of speech, the implementation of certain laws such as uh, the National Security Act and the UAPA, etc. have been an issue in India and it has caused a lot of divide within the country. So, sir, according to you, what should be the, uh, what, how should we curtail a freedom of speech or to what extent should we curtail freedom of speech in the country? First of all, National Security Act is not about freedom of speech. It's about curtailing the liberty of the individual in the interest of the security and unity and integrity of Indian Union. So, uh, let's clarify that. Therefore, let's take both the issues. To what extent can liberty, individual liberty can be curtailed and to what extent can freedom of speech be curtailed? We must understand two things. We are a nation which is still being made. Even now, there are serious challenges in northeast of India. Northeast of India. Assam, Bodo, Assam, Tripura, border disputes, Mizoram, Nagaland, you know, Arunachal Pradesh, some parts. And of course, Punjab, even now, you know, recently in, in Australia, there were some attacks on some Indian temples, some hate speeches. And from time to time in Canada, we keep seeing that. In Britain, you keep seeing that. And of course, Jammu and Kashmir, we all know. We are still a nation in the making because there's no other country more diverse than India. And therefore, the imperatives of nation building are different from a United States or a Britain or some other country. The second issue is, you cannot resort to British practice. America will not allow it. America will not allow a referendum if some state says, I want to walk out of the Federation. That was settled in the Civil War. Whereas Britain, a Northern Ireland or a Scotland, a no, every other day, the Scottish Prime Minister says, I want one more referendum. Early referendum we lost, I want one more referendum. Should we be part of UK or not? Good or bad, they have come to a civilizational stage where, if need be, they can part ways amicably and peacefully without creating uh, impenetrable borders, without having the armed forces guarding the border. So that is the level of civilization they reached. India probably will take another 100 years to come to that level. Even, even division of Andhra Pradesh state, after all, there is no line being drawn except on a map. All of our liberties are intact anywhere, whether you are in Andhra Pradesh currently or in Telangana or some other state, you enjoy the same liberties, same opportunities. And yet, see the amount of schism and the amount of uh, animosity and uh, bad blood. So we are still at that stage. Therefore, for us to be cavalier about unity of India is extremely dangerous. 
because there will not be any common market and that's our greatest advantage. Mm -hmm. And two, we will have soldiers across these borders if India, God forbid, is one day split in some form or the other, will kill each other. Therefore, the unity of India must be sacrosanct. I know there will be people who will attack me very vigorously for saying unity of India is sacrosanct. If you want to protect liberty of India, unity is sacrosanct. If you want to protect order in India, unity is sacrosanct. Unlike a British society, liberty and order can be independent of unity of the United Kingdom. In India, I am absolutely certain there cannot be order or liberty without unity of India. And therefore, even the libertarians who respect liberties and constitutional liberties and fundamental rights must recognize that there is a higher principle, even to God liberty, of protecting the unity of India, integrity of India. Therefore, the standard has to be relative to our circumstances and our historical evolution of the society and of the democracy. Considering that, I believe that the reasonable restrictions laid down by the founding fathers and continued are fairly reasonable. I cannot use the right to free speech to create animosity and hatred between communities. I may practice my own faith. It may be caste grounds or religious grounds or regional grounds. If I create animosity between people and indulge in violence, if I say I have fundamental right to say whatever I want about, let's say I'm a Telugu guy, and I'll speak ill of Tamil people, the Tamil person speaks ill of Kannada people, Kannada people speaks ill of Maharashtra, Maharashtra versus Gujarat, where is this country heading? Therefore, I believe these reasonable restrictions are necessary. Now, when it comes to liberty, what is the National Security Act? It is a, a successor law of the Maintenance of Internal Security Act, the infamous MISA. MISA was terribly abused during emergency. As a youngster, as a medical student, I rebelled against it. I was very upset and angry at that time. A hundred thousand people were incarcerated without trial for the mere sin of being in opposition to the establishment, to the Prime Minister of the day or the government of the day. Absolutely unacceptable in any democracy. They were not preaching violence. They were not preaching breakup of India. They were not preaching disorder or hatred between communities. Therefore, using that law was absolutely unacceptable. Even somebody like me was kept under surveillance merely because I protested against the emergency as a lone, um, meek and very uh, thin uh, student. So the establishment felt so threatened that they used the, the laws of the land in a perverse manner to throttle everybody. Therefore, NSA came with all the safeguards. National Security Act has all the safeguards. Now, if the safeguards are not working, there's a problem we have to figure out. For instance, this is subject to satisfaction of the district magistrate. Or if the state government is detaining, the detaining authority in that case, oftentimes it's a district magistrate because the powers under the National Security Act or similar laws are delegated to district magistrate. It is not the direction of somebody. I myself as a district magistrate received specific orders in a certain situation with some reason. The government, when they gave me a direction, it's not that they were whimsical or arbitrary. They had a reason. I still declined. I said, it's my subject to satisfaction. I am not satisfied detention of these people is necessary and warranted in public interest. It will do more harm than good. Therefore, I refuse to do that. And I stood that ground. So there is a safeguard. One is subject to satisfaction of the detaining authority. Mm -hmm. Secondly, there is an advisory board headed by a high court judge. Within 15 days, if I am not mistaken, that is the law even now, within 15 days, that advisory board must uh, ratify the detention. So we are not in the pre-emergency or emergency days when arbitrarily this power can be exercised. But please recognize that in a country like India, particularly when there is no um, effective criminal justice system, in the sense that crimes go unpunished for decades, only 10% of, uh, of the case, the criminal cases end in conviction and after years and decades. There are times when to protect the public order or unity and integrity of India, you have to apply this law. And the courts held, for instance, that it is a reasonable one. Nobody can say that Indian courts are following the dictates of the government. In fact, the contrary is true. They are telling the government to get out. <laughs> uh, so I think if we borrow the American and British uh, ideas, 
of societies that have now evolved to a level where their nations will not be victims of disorder or violence at the drop of a hat. We can compare that in the Indian situation, we are actually doing more harm than good. I don't believe that the constitutional provisions or the laws made under the constitution in the large part, specific cases the courts have judicial review, powers of judicial review and they can scrap these laws. And one last point on this. To protect the integrity of the country, there are two approaches. Take for instance, at one time, we never thought that uh, Punjab would be a problem. The Punjabi Sikhs were very proud inheritors of Indian legacy and they fought against the British. Jiranwala Bagh was in fact a seminal event that converted Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhiji never wanted uh, complete freedom, independence of India. After Jiranwala Bagh, he said, your stay here is immoral. Nothing short of total independence is acceptable. So that's such a seminal event. Where did it happen? In Punjab. Who were the principal protagonists of that whole thing at the moment there? The Punjabi Sikhs. They were an integral part of India, Indian society. Nobody thought that Punjab would have any separatist um, uh, aspirations. But we've seen what happened since in the 1980s. The humongous price the nation paid. The Prime Minister was assassinated, several leaders were assassinated, including Longawal and Bian Singh, the Chief Minister at the time. And uh, I don't know how many people, but definitely hundreds, maybe thousands of people lost their lives. And in order to protect the unity of India, which is paramount for the reasons I stated, sometimes they had to go beyond the letter of the law, or at least the spirit of the law. Now, there are two options. One is, have a weak law, ineffective law, that cannot really serve the purposes of the nation. But expect the officials to violate the law, act beyond the law, in an arbitrary and illegal manner. That's what third degree is. That's what extrajudicial executions are. We all know what's happening in the name of encounters. That's what many other unhappy things are. That's happening in India. We pretend that the law is good, but somebody is abusing the law. The other way is understand the situation and the needs of the situation and have a strong enough law with adequate safeguards and empower the law enforcement agencies protecting the unity and integrity of the nation effectively but with accountability. I any day prefer option number two. I don't want a weak law, a law not suitable to meet the needs of the situation and then expect the officials to go beyond the law, indulge in all kinds of things including encounters, sometimes with popular sanction. In Hyderabad, there was a, a, an encounter that the rapists were killed, nobody sheds a tear. But the manner of that execution was totally unconstitutional. It is not in the interest of the country. It's not even going to protect the women in the country. But because there is a complete failure of rule of law in the country, now there's a popular claim for such cases. In UP, when one no, notorious gangster was shot dead, nobody shed a tear. Now, that's a dangerous situation. If you make the law unrealistic, make the law irrelevant to the needs of the society, and then expect the missionary of government to violate the law habitually, you're actually doing more damage than having a stronger law, which meets the demands of the situation, but hold the officials to account. Sir, uh, continuing the conversation on fundamental rights, uh, sir, if we look at the right to equality, and especially in the context of this issue of reservations, Sir, it's continued to be an issue of uh, conflict. It's been divisive and sometimes the debate takes moral connotations also. Sir, how do you view the scope of the right to equality as guaranteed by the Constitution? Have the prevailing conditions of inequality changed over the years? And has Constitution had anything to do with Great it? Great question. These are two different parts to the question. Um, what is the constitutional framework and legal framework and have the conditions changed? So let us look at each of them separately. The norm is equality, equality before law. The exception is giving relevance to Indian societal conditions and culture and therefore the inequality by birth institutionalized for no fault of millions of children in the country because of this terrible caste system. What is caste system? That birth is what gives you merit, not your work, not your output, not your accomplishment or impact on society, but birth. So we have to now recognize that there are two imperatives. One is the notion of equality before law. The other is 
when they are unequal people for no fault of theirs, the opportunities are denied to them structurally, societally, as a part of culture and Hindu tradition and the caste system. Can we then pretend that there is equality before law between completely unequal people? That's the principle of affirmative action policies all over the world. It's, India is not alone, except that Indian vertical fragmentation on caste grounds is perhaps unique. But some discrimination on race or something else is universal. And therefore, the constitution makers provided a temporary provision until the equality of opportunity that the state can provide. What is the equality of opportunity you can provide? Quality education in respect to our birth, reasonable quality of healthcare available so that the productivity is there. Then you can compete with anybody. Your birth is not causing a disadvantage and you're not elbowed out of the economic system. Now, that's absolutely necessary. The imperatives of state's efficiency and the constitution specifically mentioned, without jeopardizing the imperatives of efficiency of operation, if you design a reservation system which provides an opportunity to the people who are disadvantaged by birth, it's perfectly legitimate and necessary. How else can you make a democracy work? Just because you say suddenly all castes have disappeared, all people are equal, uh, how will people deal with that? So that's the only possible way of preserving unity of India across the social divides and building cohesion in our society. Therefore, I think constitution makers did a wonderful thing. Where we have faltered is in betraying the constitution makers' vision. Why did Dr. Ambedkar say that there will be reservation for 10 years? No, 10 or 15, doesn't matter exact number, eh? but a finite period. Why? Because during this period, the state was expected to do what was necessary to minimize this uh, divide by providing equal opportunity in the form of quality education and quality health care. We have spectacularly failed until today. Even today, 80% of the kids going to schools have no future. It's a lie. Everybody is going to school. We have Right to Education Act. We have all kinds of government programs, trillions of rupees, hundreds of thousands of crores of rupees, lakhs of crores of rupees is being spent. All this is nice, but the net outcome is disastrous. And once it's disastrous, instead of figuring out how to provide this opportunity, equality of opportunity, the Indian state and the political system dishonestly are perpetuating reservations and pretending that there's a solution. It is not solving the problem. And we have a unique situation where the groups that are getting the affirmative action benefit they are dissatisfied quite rightly because they are denied the opportunity even there. Only certain families that have come out of poverty, that are educated, they are able to take care of the second generation. But the bulk of the poor from these segments of the deprived sections of the population for generations, they are not getting any significant benefit. So they are unhappy, quite understandably. The rest of the people, they believe that their opportunities are given away to somebody else, therefore they are unhappy. No, it requires genius to create a system where both the groups are unhappy. It's the way we operate it. That was never the intention of the constitution makers. Until and unless we improve the quality of education and give a modicum of health care, reasonable quality, effective, accessible, affordable health care to every person, you cannot give equality of opportunity in the country. And luckily, as a country, we are capable of doing, we have the resources, we have the technology. We just have to have the political vision and administrative ability. Now, the second part of the question, have, has the dream of Indian constitution makers been realized? It's already answered in a way. If it's realized, we would not have this mess. We have to now ensure that that dream is realized. And meanwhile, even the limited benefits that go to these sections, we must ensure that the deserving people get it. If you create a class of uh, people within the deprived sections who have come out of that poverty, who can take care of their children, but they in perpetuity get all the benefits of reservation without any advantage to the really deprived people, disadvantaged people, then you created a Western interest for some people at the cost of the rest of the deprived sections. Therefore, the whole idea of creamy layer and many other forms but all this is okay. That is more to remove the, the, the anger and the pain from various sections. But the real thing is quality education, particularly at the school level, because the reservation is the higher education level. 
When the school education collapsed, what reservation are you talking about? And when higher education is in disrepair in most parts of the country, it doesn't matter what degree you get, let me be blunt. You have a degree or a post-graduation or a PhD often has no relevance in our country, in most part. There are of course a few significant exceptions, but in general, without mincing words, we must honestly say our education has collapsed. Our healthcare is in shambles. So, while we can do some tinkering here and there, this is only to assuage the feelings and to get the political capital. But the real thing is, have we given quality education irrespective of the circumstances of birth? Because every group, every individual is endowed by nature or by God with a lot of potential, a lot of ability. But if we don't harness it through proper education, and if we don't give productivity through proper health care, the lack of opportunity continues. Inequality of opportunity. Therefore, inequality in society continues no matter what the constitution said. So, pretension that we are now doing social justice by reservations is just that pretension. And our anger that some people are cornering all the benefits is nothing but a self-serving argument without recognizing the social inequalities in our country. I know this will anger many people in the country, but once in a while we must hold a mirror to ourselves, search our souls and find honest answers. You cannot have a democracy where the bulk of the people have no realistic opportunity merely because of circumstances of birth. That democracy becomes only notional, not real democracy. Honestly, that's where we are in, in a significant measure. So this leads to a larger question of how do we strike the right balance between adhering to uh, the principles of our founding fathers when they drafted the constitution and the changing times? Dr. Ambedkar himself said, and Babu Rajendra Prasad, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, who was the chairman of the Constituent Assembly, and later the first president of the Republic, they both said eloquently at the time of promulgation of the Constitution, on the, fought, on the 26th of November 1949, the Constitution was actually enacted. But to come into operation from 26th January, because in 19, from 1930 onwards, we celebrated 26th of January as the Purnaswaraj Day. That is the symbolism of 26th January. Otherwise, the constitution was actually approved two months before that. So, at the time of approval of the constitution, both these great men, Ambedkar and uh, Babu Rajan Prasad, they said very clearly, at the end of the day, it is the quality of people who actually operate the constitution. The constitution can point a direction, can give you a framework. But if we operate it perversely for personal gain, without protecting the institutions of state and the people of India, then the constitution can only do this much. Constitution is not a mantra. You chant the mantra and suddenly great things happen. You know, typically in the Indian folklore, there is a belief like that. That's all the stuff of uh, mythology. In real life, the institutions must be made to, made to work. Now, there are three very definite challenges. The first is the political culture we evolved. The constitution never talked about political parties. In a country like Germany, they understood the importance of political parties. In fact, there was never, there's not even a law in India, let alone the constitutional framework about political parties. And political parties, initially they were democratic, they were uh, uh, inclusive, and they were imbued by a spirit of idealism and humanism. But eventually the lust for power, and the fractures of Indian society and therefore the caste wars and religious divides and regional divides and linguistic divides, they became the primary means of mobilization of the people in politics. So on the one hand, corruption because of lust for power, give money for vote, short-term freebies at the cost of long-term good, just power at any cost, doesn't matter, future is doomed. And divisions in society, they became the, the, the basic currency of politics. Now, that is not what the constitution makers anticipated. And we certainly did not create an appropriate political culture. The electoral system we have chosen actually perpetuated that. But it's not the fault of the constitution. The constitution makers did not say there must be a first-past-the-post system. If people go through it carefully in the constitution, you will find the wording is very deliberately done. It provided space for some form of proportional representation. They talked about the number of seats in a constituency. They did not talk about single member constituency and first past the post system. But because of our adherence to British model, even more uh, diligently than the British themselves adhered, uh, we are simply following that. Britain gave it up in many cases except in case of uh, uh, House of Commons. But we are adhering to that despite the constitutional 
freedom available. So it's not the failure of the Constitution, it's our failure to imagine, to understand our needs. The second is, therefore, not only the electoral system, but the political parties becoming autocratic and private estates. Most political parties of India, let's be truthful, they are family estates, private fiefdoms. Therefore, leadership is not nurtured. When Ambedkar and Rajendra Prasad said, it depends on the men and women who operate, what does it mean? We must do something to nurture quality leadership. How does it happen? Through political parties and the political culture. If we destroy leadership by making political parties private estates, by having a political culture that, that depends entirely on the money power and divisions in society, how can leadership come up? So it is our failure post-independence, not the constitution's failure. The third is a broad social and political consensus is required for democracy to work and the constitution to work. In a broad measure, I think still the consensus prevails, but the consensus is fracturing on occasion. The moment certain provisions of the constitution or the notion of Indian nation, the collective, is uncomfortable to me politically or otherwise, if I am willing to give up on the constitution and the unity of India, then the consensus is breaking down. But in the large part, I would say, despite all our infirmities and deficiencies, an extraordinarily fractious country, diverse country with a complex culture, the political parties and the leadership has held the consensus even today. But it's, it's now fracturing on occasion. There are dangers here and there. But without these three, the political culture, the quality of leadership nurtured by a political system, including the party system, and the broad consensus operating in the country, without these three in tandem, constitution in itself will not be able to deliver. So it's for us, the succeeding generations, to address all these three and to renew every day. Even if everything is good today, it doesn't guarantee that tomorrow is going to be good. America, many people thought, no, wonderful constitution, by and large operated well. The civil war, you know, whatever fractures were there, civil war cemented them, they sorted out the issues. But look at what Trump had done. And look at the way the beacon of democracy and hope suddenly became a very fractured and fragmented society and uncertain as to what will happen now, what will happen next, will they accept the verdict? Now Brazil imitated America recently. When Bolsonaro lost the election, his supporters went and invaded all the uh, organs of state, their buildings, etc. And tomorrow some other country will do it. So even if things are going well and they are not going well enough in our country, we have done a reasonably good job, let's be objective but not good enough a job. Even if they are going well, there is no guarantee tomorrow will not be a bad day. So constant vigilance, that's why when people say eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, every generation and each citizen must be conscious, at least the leadership, the influential people, the elites, the opinion makers. If we simply give the fundamentals the go-by for temporary expediency, then there is a humongous price to be paid by the society. Uh, so, one of the notable features of the constitution, as you rightly mentioned, is guaranteeing the universal adult franchise from the get-go. And so, you mentioned that it was a brilliant, audacious experiment. Uh, but so, while while we believe that it is important that, you know, everybody over the age of 18 should be, have should have the right to vote, a lot of people think that it was done quite hastily. And, <laughs> and during that time, because of rampant poverty, illiteracy, you know, our democratic, uh, we did not have democratic institutions and we were in an infancy stage of democracy. So, what do you think of uh, this argument, sir? You no, know, it's a and complex question. It's also, in some ways, a redundant question. But I disagree with those who believe that universal franchise was a bad idea. If the vote is limited to elites with education, income, these are the, uh, and property. By definition, it will go to the people who are exercising power unjustly in an unequal society. There is no reason to believe that these elites should be so large hearted that they work for the bulk of humanity, not themselves, and therefore build a society which is fit for universal franchise. They would have perpetuated inequality forever in the guise of some kind of a democracy, guided democracy or whatever you call it, and the country would not be truly democratic. Therefore, universal franchise is the only way by which the assertion of the people, however slowly as they understand the power of the vote and the need for change in society, that would push the system towards a, a greater justice, greater equality and opportunity. And that's the reason why our leaders embraced universal franchise. They had no doubt whatsoever. 
If a mistake was committed, it was pre-independence. The British were slowly moving towards greater and greater franchise and self-government. For instance, 1919, at the state level, there was a diarchy. That means the governor had reserved powers, reserve powers, and the elected government had some powers, not full. 1935 Act, the state elected premier or the government said almost as many powers as they have today. The governor's reserve powers have taken away, but they brought that uh, the concept to the federal government, which never was operated. That's a different matter. But the constitutional scheme was that. Now, our leaders elected in 1937 in the elections at the state level were doing a remarkable job for a nascent democracy during a colonial regime without any serious experience of democracy for about a thousand years. Cholas, we had wonderful local democracy with all the trappings of the caste system then. We must not judge them by today's standards, but uh, by those standards, it was a remarkable experiment of Tarmiru inscription, etc. Even much earlier, 2500 years ago, the republics in the northern India, the Dichavis, the uh, even Shakyas, Buddhas from one such republic, um, all the tribes, they were republican democracies. And unfortunately, they were destroyed by Alexander's invasion. Therefore, the Mauryan Empire came into existence subsequently. So we had that experience historically, but there was no continuity. For about a thousand years, India had no real experience of running a democracy. And considering that, 37, the governments were doing a remarkable job. And these were all exceptional men and women, imbued by the spirit of freedom struggle, idealism, and the ideas of humanism, French Revolution, and of course, Mahatma Gandhi's moral influence. Unfortunately, that experiment was cut short by the Second World War. Mahatma Gandhi directed them to resign because Britain, in the face of the monumental threat from Hitler, decided to go to war and Indian government also declared war at the behest of British government. Now, it's very easy to be counterfactual in history and it's very easy to say things could have been different. I don't know what things would have been. But perhaps in retrospect, Gandhiji's decision that the governments at the state level should resign denied us a fantastic experience of self-government. If such leadership gave themselves two terms, institutionalized local governments and people understood both the extent of power and the limitations of state power and understood freedom with responsibility in those 10 years because of exceptional leadership, probably our democracy would have worked better. And if some of the distortions that were taking place subsequently appeared then itself, probably that great leadership would have thought of correctives instead of simply getting deeper and deeper into the mire. So maybe we lost a chance, but then in history, there are so many uh, nooks and corners. You cannot decide. No, nobody anticipated that the Second World War would come and Britain would be fighting with the backs to the wall mm -hmm. and the whole world would be uh, completely at the mercy of Hitler and freedom itself would be in danger. So no. The circumstances were different. Uh, you cannot now undo history. But post that, post 1950, the failure, if any, was while we did a good job of building some institutions, the Election Commission, the courts, the Public Service Commission, the CAG, the Finance Commission in dealing with union state relationships, all these worked pretty well with some distortions here, but on the whole, they worked well. But perhaps not enough attention was paid to, look at the, to looking at the political culture the political parties, the electoral system, local governments. If there's one failing in the constitution, it is that we did not institutionalize local governments. And Ambedkar and Gandhiji, they had difference of opinion. By the time Gandhiji passed, Gandhiji, as we all know, was a fanatic about local governments. He passionately believed in local governments and power at the local level and at the village level. Only thing is he had an idyllic notion of a village in India. Uh, I grew up in a village, I don't share the strategic notion. I believe empowerment of local people is absolutely critical, but not necessarily in the same form as the village structure is. Because villages also, as Ambedkar said repeatedly, they are dens of casteism and corruption. They were unequal entities. I mean, there is a segregation of population on the basis of caste in a village. So that is the primary unit was a bad idea. Probably we should have conceived of local governments of a larger level putting together several villages so that the economies of scale are there, but more important, to some extent, the traditional caste oppression is loosened in a larger entity. 
and universal franchise and democracy would have accepted themselves. Instead of finding that answer, Ambedkar's fear of local elites capturing power and continuing to oppress the Dalits and depressed classes. And Gandhiji's romantic idealism, or Gandhiji's followers romantic idealism, both were two extremes. They did not find a sensible uh, middle ground which would work. And because they did not find it, Nambedkar called the shots, they did not, they denied the local governments a space in the constitution and architecture. They should have actually built a three-tier government like in Germany, etc. They should have made local governments effective and empowered right to the beginning itself. They failed to do so. And now even if you want to do it, A, we have very flawed uh, efforts, you know, some well-meaning 73rd, 74th amendments, etc. And B, already there are certain entrenched powerful forces which don't want any competing forces. The MLS, they don't want local governments to compete with their power. They feel threatened. The bureaucracy, very powerful, almighty bureaucracy, all India services and others, they feel local governments are a nuisance. Even the civil society groups, they are actually not committed to local governments. You'll be surprised. Many of them are happy to deal with bureaucracy rather than the local governments. So we created a whole body of opinion in the country, powerful elites, who are inimical to local governments, even as they pay lip sympathy to local governments. So it become very hard. So probably that is a single failing of the constitution. Otherwise, I don't think there is any substitute to universal franchise. But the franchise would have worked much better if people understood the link between the vote and the consequences at the local level. That's only possible at the local level. And between the taxes they pay and the services they get. And that opportunity being denied, most of our democracy became symbolic. It's all reduced to voting and protesting shouting on the streets. But that's not the failure of the constitution, it's our failure post-independence in making democracy work. So, uh, why would you say that the 73rd and the 74th amendments were flawed? They did two things terribly badly. In fact, you could not do worse if you plan to do badly. What is the way the constitution must do? A, the constitution must guarantee empowerment of local governments. The power and the resources. And the control of the bureaucracy to the extent that the power has to be exercised. This amendment completely failed to assure that. Very, very vacillating, obfuscating, uh, you know, the state legislature may, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, the real purpose is not served. The second part, in the federal system, what is required in a very vast country? India is bigger than Europe, please remember. And diversity-wise, there's no continent which is comparable to India, let alone maybe the whole of Africa may be equal to India in diversity. The language, the caste, the region, the religion, and so on and so forth. In such a system, you must ensure the principle of local governance, effective local governance, empowered local governance, but with flexibility to suit the local population, local history local culture, local experience. But instead, Indian constitution is the only one in the world, I dare say, where the local government structure is rigidly defined in the constitution itself, 7,700 words of that, 73rd, 74th amendments. Longer than the American constitution, even today. The original constitution of the United States was 4,700 words long. The constitution with amendments, 15 or so amendments so far, is 7,700 words in the United States. This 73rd, 74th amendments alone, you talked about 395 articles and a very long uh, constitution in India, with, with, with good reason, because certain detail was necessary to protect the future. I think it served as well. But this particular part is verbose, longer than the American constitution today, but ultimately created a very rigid structure, and therefore the states have no stakes in that. And it's not suitable to our needs in most parts of the country. So it did exactly the wrong thing. Structure should have been flexible left to the states. Power should have been defined very clearly, unambiguously, so that the states could not play fall. So it's all wrong, well-meaning. But good intentions are not enough. If good intentions alone are sufficient, the world would be a fantastic place. The instruments you create, the institutions you build, the practices that you institutionalize, that is what shapes the outcomes, not intentions. The way to hell is often paired with good intentions. So I don't doubt the intentions, I don't doubt the motives, but that's irrelevant. The outcome is appallingly bad. So, so um, it 
In addition to the 73rd and 74th Amendment, um, so do you think there are any other areas that the Constitution fails at? Um, and maybe you can shed some light on. As I said, not institutionalizing local governments was uh, the yes. fundamental failing of the Constitution. 73rd and 74th Amendments, a big amendment engineering that without careful thought and without deep understanding of the issues and institutions, without the insights, was a disaster. And we are not able to correct it because there is no stomach, there is no appetite for improving local governance in the country. Kerala is the only state, at least to some extent, is making honest efforts. There is almost no other part of the country where genuine efforts are being made. Some lip sympathy is paid from time to time. Barring that, I don't think there is anything fundamentally wrong with the Constitution. Maybe excessive protection afforded to bureaucracy is something that could have been avoided. But then we must also understand the compulsions at that time. When India became free, and today we are judging by contemporary standards, partition unleashed so much of violence. About a million plus people, probably 12 lakhs or 15 lakh people were butchered on both sides. For no fault of this, merely because they were born in a certain religious faith. And about 12 to 15 million people had to migrate permanently. You know, how much of a dislocation it is, you know, your family, your households, your tradition, your history. If you lose one person in the family, there is a lot of grief. You lost everything, your culture, your roots, your house, your, your upbringing, your, everything is lost. And you are asked to move or this side of the line or that side of the line. Arbitrarily created by that radically for priorities. And in that mayhem and violence, with very few resources and no literacy, and all the castes and regions and religions, our political leaders felt that continuity of administration is vital. That's a right decision. But continuity need not have been giving abnormal protection. Ultimately, you require stability of the executive branch of government, appointed civil servants, but accountability. Now, this protection came at the cost of accountability completely. And therefore, bureaucracy in an asymmetric society, ours is a sort of asymmetric power. The public servants who are paid by the public exchequer, who are supposed to serve the public needs, have actually become the masters because they are more powerful than 90% of the people of the country. And Article 311, and the way it was interpreted and applied, since then, across the board, meant that you have now a class of people who are now the masters. The people are the mendicants. And the subsequent uh, half-baked understanding of socialism, without giving equal opportunity, quality education, health care, you made all economic activity under state control and created a license permit control raj. This combination became deadly. So that probably constitution makers did not envisage the future problems that are going to emanate from a very powerful entrenched bureaucracy in a very unequal system and society. Um, but that could have been corrected by us. We failed to do so. Even today we are not doing it. Sir, you talked about how the amending power given in the constitution is a good feature of the constitution. So recently the remarks made by our Vice President on the Basic Structure Doctrine have stirred up a hornet's nest. So, so what is your opinion? Does the Basic Structure Doctrine not have a basis in the Constitution? Has it usurped? It's a good question. Okay. It's, it's a very good question. And I don't think there is a single answer acceptable to everybody. If there is a broad social consensus in society about what the constitutional governance should be like, then there is no need for a basic structure. Britain does not even have a written constitution. But nobody seriously questions the continuation of that form of democracy they have chosen. Because there is a powerful social sanction behind it. If the governments and the legislatures have the temptation to act whimsically once they have a majority, as they did during emergency. Remember, the context of basic features is emergency and certain things that happen during that period. That means the social consensus has broken down. And the people's verdict and the constitutional values, there is a clash. Then, if you rigorously define the basic features, narrowly and rigorously define, for instance, I believe universal franchise federalism, independent constitutional authorities, including the, the independence of the judiciary, federalism, including strong local governments, rule of law, 
equality before law and rule of law. Meaning thereby that nobody is above the law and you can't abuse power arbitrarily, etc. These and these alone must be the basic features. If you keep them open and whatever comes to your hat, you want to include in the basic features doctrine, then you're usurping not only the executive's power and legislature's power, you're usurping the constitution maker's power. Therefore, a narrowly defined, a sensible, pragmatic, reasonable uh, outline of basic features is perhaps desirable in any context because from time to time, there's a temptation to use the legislative numbers to overrule the basic social compact in the country and the constitutional values. But if we build a society where the social compact is very strong and people adhere to constitutional values uh, intuitively, then I suppose there's no need for basic structure. What is wrong with our uh, basic features doctrine is the court has kept it all open. Almost anything they, they dislike, they can say it's violated to basic features. That's a very dangerous power for anybody to have. It's a kind of power monarchs exercised. Now, Supreme Court of India is not a monarch, should never become a monarch. Just as the executive branch of the government or the legislative branch cannot become monarchs. But on balance, I think a narrowly defined set of basic features is perhaps desirable in India. Sir, I, this was a great conversation, sir. I think we were able to clarify a lot, um, you know, about the constitution and we spoke in a way that a common man in India would understand, you know, more about the constitution and even our policy and governance challenges, sir. So thank you very much for this discussion. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I agree with you, Shweta. Uh, and I think in an approach that's been characteristic of you and FDR, we were able to look at a lot of contentious issues uh, in a very objective, rational and a pragmatic manner. Thank you, sir. My pleasure, uh, Sumetha. You know, democracy is a messy system. We must have patience. And a reformer in particular must have infinite patience. If you allow yourselves to be swung by day-to-day -day happenings, go to extremes, almost always you will fail. Some amount of willingness to accommodate the adversary's point of view, but adhering to the basic principle without deviating from the median too much and reconciling conflicting interests. It's very vital. For instance, judiciary, I believe basic features on the whole might have served as well, provided, as I said, narrowly defined. Mm -hmm. But does not mean that the judges of the kings are the gods of the country. Judges usurping their authority, authority of the, of the political executive or the legislature is completely unconstitutional. We are not a theocracy. Judiciary also must exercise restraint as must executive, as must legislature. At the end of the day, as they all say repeatedly, it's ultimately the voter and the citizen. But I would not like to either blame the voter or put too much a burden on them. It is the quality of the middle classes and the enlightened sections of public opinion, the elites of the country, not only the political elites, the bureaucracy, the media, the thinking people whose word is respected across the country, those with influence and public intellectuals, if you do not adhere to certain basic norms very fairly, without any political polarization or partisanship, you may vote for whom you like. But examine issues dispassionately and grounds of fact and logic and global experience, best practices. Don't doctor the evidence to suit your political predilections. If I like Narendra Modi, I support whatever he say, says or does. If I don't like Narendra Modi, I oppose whatever he says or does, irrespective of merits. I think much of India is in that direction. That's not what constitution makers wanted. None of us is a god. None of us is infallible. The idea of a constitution is the recognition that none of us is infallible. Even good, well-meaning people are not infallible. Mahatma Gandhi was not infallible. Dr. Ambedkar was not infallible. Nobody is. Nobody can be infallible. And ultimately, we must learn to live with imperfections of human beings and the broader principles of the constitution and they alone must be our guide. And I hope that in these troubled times when too many people are losing their temper and getting angry with each other and uh, not able to tolerate a descending point of view, a different point of view, uh, I hope we will calm down a little bit and recognize that these are transient. There's a bigger purpose here to make our collective life more meaningful, more harmonious, more productive, 
more prosperous and everybody gets an opportunity. Uh, I'm a great believer in the future of our country. I believe the constitution gave us a wonderful opportunity despite all the distortions and mistakes. We've done a fabulous job. Uh, the linguistic reorganization, strengthening of federalism, institutions, uh, constitutional institutions striking roots, peaceful transfer of power which is not challenged, you know, remarkable. Look at Brazil, look at United States and India, you may fight and do all ugly things to get elected, but once elections are over, we're all willing to agree that somebody is elected lawfully. I may not be happy with that, with the choice, but I accept that choice, the legitimacy of it. And I think we must agree on these fundamentals. If that's not there, this country will be torn apart to the detriment of the future generations. I have no doubt about it. It's not merely about Bharat Mata and unity. It's about the future generations, the stability of the society. It's about order. It's about freedom for the next generation. Therefore, constitution must be taken as an extremely serious document. And we must learn to go a little deeper into that. Uh, instead of facile statements about you know, rewriting the constitution, etc. I believe we don't even have the ability to rewrite the constitution even if we want to. An elegant constitution reconciling the conflicts in society, we don't have that capacity any longer. Some of the amendments brought about subsequently, the wording is so vulgar and um, unseemly. So I, I don't think we have the capacity. It's a bad idea to revisit the constitution's fundamentals. It's a good idea to correct the distortions as they appear from time to time. That's what the constitution makers intended. Thank you, sir. Thank you.